All right. It shows that we are live. I should be streaming right now simultaneously on Rumble and YouTube. It's good to see everybody. I'm going to give it a second for people to filter in, and let me just double check everything on my end to make sure that the stream is indeed up and running. Definitely leave a comment and question uh, of anything you guys want to shout out today. Anything you want to ask me, super chats are certainly welcome. Let's see here. It doesn't show that we're up and running, but it says I'm up and running. So let's see here. Mm-hmm. Leave a comment if you guys can see and hear me. <laughs> All right. All right. Hold on. Make sure. Because on this end, it shows that I'm not. Okay. Yeah, I'm totally live. What's up, everybody? <laughs> yeah, guys. All right. So definitely leave a question. Super chats are welcome. I have a few things to share in this video, some of which uh, those of you have been following me for years. I'm going to retouch on a few things. Um, but there's been some developments involving the Rishot structure. This site keeps on getting more and more interesting, and the evidence continues to stack that it is by far the most likely location for Atlantis. Now, for those of you who don't think that, if nothing else, I'm here to tell you that the evidence that catastrophic water flow blasted over the Rishot has become more apparent than ever. If you haven't seen the TV show, The Grand Tour, which is on Amazon Prime, they just had a new episode. In fact, their last episode ever uh, was in Mauritania, and that just went live last Friday. If you have not seen it, it is a must-see. And I've taken some screenshots of the topography and terrain of the filming that they did because they went to the Rishot structure. And so seeing that ground footage of them driving in and around it, everything about that site is is has the signature traits of being blasted by catastrophic water flow, like water-formed canyons and valleys. It's there for all who have eyes to see. Um, let's see here. Let's double check. Do you guys see me and hear me well? Let me just make sure on that before I start yattering off for an hour before you guys. Okay. Looks like we're good. All right. So where do we begin? As more and more people filter in, I'm going to get to the juicy stuff. People are filtering in. So just give it a second. What questions do you guys have while I let this uh, the following everyone jump in here? Yes, I am going to go to the wrist shot. Uh, some of those details are a bit private at this time, but stay tuned. Uh, that's something that I am planning on. Um, so let's see here. Did you guys hear the Joe Rogan episode uh, just the other day with Cat Williams? Uh, so let's just give Joe Rogan a congratulations because he just renewed his Spotify deal and it includes all the major platforms again, unlike the previous deal. He's uploading onto Apple, and YouTube. So we are now blessed to have all the episodes on YouTube, Apple, Spotify. And what's great is that we got that comment section back, the beloved comment section. Uh, how have we missed that, right? Um, all right, so let's see here. In fact, let me know. I'm going to try to play this clip for you. I don't know if it will have sound or not. So let's see here. One second. I'll come back to it. So let me add something that's completely and utterly bizarre. Okay, hold on a second. Mm. Bear with me, people. Share screen. Let me first see if this will play. Let me know if you guys Have can you hear ever the seen sound. The, the guy that thinks that they found the spot in Africa. Press what one is if that, you can uh, hear sound. That, press two if you cannot hear anything. Called? So I can press stop on this real quick. The Jamie Corsetti. Press one if you can is, hear the sound. Uh, he's on this. This cannot. dude is an, an expert in this shit. Can you hear he's it? an expert okay. in uh, ancient catastrophes and, and the remnants and the evidence that shows that these civilizations existed and something happened. And he's focused on this one area in Africa that he believes is Atlantis. And he, he says it has all the hallmark the characteristics the and there's all the evidence of massive water erosion surrounding the area that at one point in time, it's very likely that this area got hit with a massive flood and it matches all the characteristics of Atlantis. When you see it, when you see the way the, the concentric circles of rings, like yeah. try explaining this, <clears throat> like, you're going to see it and try explaining this through a natural phenomenon that doesn't exist anywhere around it. Right. Concentric circles that is near what used to be water and there's heavy water erosion marks all around it. 
that indicate massive amounts of quick flowing water in a very short period of time. Right. Yeah. Uh, I forget what it's called, but I know exactly where it is. It's right here. Changes of man. That's it. Look at that thing, bro. Are you fucking kidding me? The reshot structure. That's it. The reshot structure. I mean, are you fucking kidding me? Now imagine if that was this massive city of concentric circles and walls and a thriving population, and then it gets hit with this water. You can see the water erosion all over the place. The whole thing looks like it's washed out. See? Yeah. It looks like it was washed out because it was. Right. And that's salt, I believe. But that's yes, what there's makes... salt there. That's the other thing. All right. Let me know you guys can hear me now, now that that's done playing. So let me say a few things. One, Joe Rogan is such a gentleman. He is a total sweetheart. I absolutely love him. Um, he was completely generous to call me an expert. Now, let's just be clear. I, even I don't consider myself an expert. I have been clear on this. Like, in fact, when I was on his show for the first time, I specifically said, I'm like, I don't consider myself an expert. And I was just on, uh, I did an interview with Kim Iverson just earlier this week. You should go check that out. Kim Iverson's awesome. But even on there, I said, you know, I'm not an expert. Because um, what's an expert? If there's anything we've seen over the last few years is that many of the people who consider themselves and self-proclaimed experts were so full of shit, right? Um, the so-called experts, right? The, the experts are people, I mean, what makes someone an expert, right? Now, I've definitely studied up on the wrist shot quite a bit. I've looked into it probably more than anybody. Uh, there's other people worth mentioning who have gone there. Let me give a shout out to David Stig Hansen that just got back from Mauritania for a third time. Absolutely epic. Um, he just up uploaded a video last night about it. Uh, I can't wait to watch it. Um, but anyways, that being said, Joe Rogan is such an unbelievable gentleman, gentleman and it meant the world to me. Uh, for him to say that. Someone just asked me, what do you call yourself? An independent researcher. I, As I've said before, all I know is that I don't know. The more I research, the more things I learn, the more I realize just how little we know. Um, True Patriot just left me an awesome super chat. He said, hey man, thank you for your content. I never knew about the Rishot structure until I watched your videos. Put this towards a satellite phone on your trip. Stay safe, stay based. Thank you so much, brother. That's very nice of you. I really appreciate that. Um, Yes. So stay tuned. What up? Oh, I see Nerdrotic in the chat. Um, I see people saying Atlantis was in Azores. Hey, look, it's possible it was one of the satellite uh, cities. Let's be clear. Atlantis was said to be an empire made up of 10 kingdoms. But the part that I'm exploring is the aspect of a city made up of concentric circles, specifically three of water and two of land, opening to the sea at the south, mountain to the north named Atlas, and many, many other similarities, which matches the Rishat structure. Some people are hell bent on not believing the wrist shots. I, I find that bizarre because I think it's premature and foolish to rule it out. For me, I'll say that I'm 99% on it, but I can't be certain. It's possible Atlantis never existed, and it's possible that if it did, it's not the wrist shot. But when you have so many spectacular similarities, I mean, the red, black, white color stones, abundance of gold, elephants, um, and many other uh, characteristics that are so specific. This is something that I'm like, how can we just ignore this? And so that brings me to some other completely bizarre things involving the Rishot structure. Let me present to you here. One second. All right. So, I'll hold on here. Do, 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 do. Forgive me while I have a stroke on here to try and make this work. One second. Up screen, present, slides, here we go. That's how you do it. Okay. So those of you that are following me on social media, you would have seen this recently as I've been posting it. What you're looking at here is a, a year 2000 mission patch from the National Reconnaissance Office. Now, to those who are you are not familiar with the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, it's part of the big five intelligence agencies within the United States, which includes the CIA and the NSA, the DIA, NGO. Um, and so of all places, this is their mission patch. Now, to those of you who are not familiar with the occult and secret societies, pay close attention to where the owl lies, because the owl is worshipped in various secret societies, 
Moloch. Um, there's all kinds of uh, spiritual uh, uh, um, meaning to it. But of all of all sites, let me go back here. Focus in where the owl eyes intersect and tell me that is not precisely over the Rishat structure. And not only that, notice how they cropped out the northeast portion of the African continent in order to center this. Now, the meaning of the patch, as you can see down below with these two intersecting paths, the meaning of it has to do with a uh, satellite launch that they had done. And, and just so you know, guys, this is real. As you can see, I have it right here out of the Smithsonian archives. Um, and I'm going to share some other utterly bizarre patches that the NRO has created. But look at this and tell me that's not one of the most bizarre things. I mean, honestly, why? Why this? Tell me that this isn't right over, smack dab over the Rishot structure. Uh, if nothing else, this is worthy of questions. Uh, but they have some other bizarre ones too. I mean, look at this, Atlas V, and this just to be clear, Atlas was said to be the very first king of Atlantis. So I find the name Atlas interesting, but Atlas has been used in names going back thousands of years, just to be clear. But they have other ones that are bizarre. I mean, look at this one. Nothing is beyond our reach. In fact, let me just go back to this one real quick so you can see it says, we own the night. And so the owl signifies that the owl has, you know, some of the best vision in the animal kingdom uh, at night. Um, oh, we got a quick uh, super chat from Brad Reed. It says, bro, YouTube Itchy Boots is a geologist and rode to the center of the ridge on our dirt bike and gives uh, an educated talk about what it is. Dude, she is so wonderful. I'm drawing a blank on her first name. I follow her. Uh, is it Mindy? Um, if you guys aren't following Itchy Boots, this woman is one intrepid lady. Like, she went to the wrist shot structure alone, and she has a motorbike, and she, she rides it all over the world. Thank you for pointing that out, Brad. Um, we got another super chat from House Mix Play. Love you, brother. Love these streams. Blessings to you and yours. Just show my girlfriend your vids on the wrist shot, and she was intrigued. Thanks for your content. Appreciate you saying that. Hey, guys, let me be clear here. Uh, I am not the first person to come up with the Atlantis wrist shot structure theory. As I mentioned in my first few videos on the topic, as well as in other podcasts, there was a documentary I came, I came across. Uh, I, I first saw it in 2018, but it's a 2011 documentary called Visiting Atlantis by a George S. Alexander and Natalie Rosen. They were the ones that came up with the theory. Although apparently this other guy named Otto something, I have his book right over there. I can't read it from here, but um, he came up with the theory back in the 80s, apparently. So uh, just to be clear, what I'm most proud of is that I have exponentially built upon the evidence that that's the site, at least triple or quadruple the amount of data points that I've came up with uh, and, and gone down this rabbit hole. So uh, give credit where it's due, uh, George S. Alexander and Natalie Rosen. But what's bizarre is that these people have like disappeared. They're from South Africa, by the way. So I'm not saying they disappeared off the face of the earth, but they're Freemasons. They come up with this theory. They do a compelling documentary and then they drop it like a bad habit and never talk about it again, which I find interesting. I don't know what to make of it, um, but it's interesting. Um, but that being said, I am very prideful that I've brought this topic uh, to millions of people. That, guys, I am not trying to put my name in any type of journals or publishings. I have a desire to write a textbook, as you've seen, I've never written a book. Um, what I do enjoy doing is presenting interesting information to as many people as possible and getting people to think for themselves. Because going down this rabbit hole involving lost ancient civilizations, it's become abundantly clear that there was a civilization that was wiped out by a cataclysm. And that civilization was doing spectacular things. Some things that exceed our capabilities today, depending on how you look at it. I'm not saying that there's anything the ancients did that we cannot do today, but they did things that far exceed the known capabilities. Like I said before, it's the sexiest topic imaginable. But let me get back to these slides. So look at this creepy one from uh, their mission 39. Nothing beyond our reach with the octopus over the world. Like, what are they talking about? Well, obviously, this involves satellites, so there's nothing they can't see. But Tell me that's not, that's not fascinating. But now, so this is a 2010 document from the Rockefeller Foundation. You know, the Rockefellers? And look, I can't, I don't know if it's going to let me zoom in on this. Give me half a second here. I don't think it's going to let me. Uh, no, it's not. Look closely at look over those concentric circles over the northwest portion of the Western Sahara. And tell me that's not only right over the Rashad structure, but look at the concentric circles. This document is titled Scenarios for the Future of Technology and International Development. You know, I haven't gone fully down that rabbit hole yet um, as far as what the document means and everything. 
but come on. Like Rockefeller's associated with Illuminati and the powers that be they're controlling the world, right? Um, what on earth is that about? Let me give a quick shout out here to Bacardi Batman on Rumble. It just left me a screen. He said, we should crowdfund our own drone scan of the area. Oh, I'm on it. Somebody said the audio is really bad. Is the audio bad? Let me know what you guys think. Hit one if the audio is good. If it's, hopefully it's just that one gentleman. Let me go back over to the live chat on YouTube because people will tell me. Yeah, the audio sucks. Okay, one second. It's because I played that other thing. Give me a second here. Agenda 21. Okay, so the audio. Okay. All right. Choppy as hell. Give me half a second here. Let me play with this. Don't you worry. Show must go on. Half a second. Let me do this. Okay. You guys hear me now? Hopefully that's better. <laughs> Go figure. Um, I'm just some comments. Is the audio better now? Because I want to get the show on the road. And the audio is better. Awesome. Much better. Okay, we're, we're back up and running. I see all the ones. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you letting me know. Um, let's see. We got Jim Salata that says, I agree. The rear shot looks intriguing, but why we arrived? Uh, by vote to Egypt. Why wouldn't Egypt have been destroyed by s the same water that hit the wrist shots? I'm 100% convinced that land has existed. These are good questions. So something happened over Africa. And as the legend goes that the Egyptians were said to be colonists of that uh, civilization that was obliterated by some sort of water cataclysm. So um, hold on a second here. Let me get this on here. Okay. I see all your comments. Thank you guys. Um, I think we have to uh, wrap our heads around that the Sahara Desert was significantly different at the time that the land has existed. And that perhaps it was right at the ocean, perhaps the elevation was lower. Um, if you actually look at the translation, uh, the word Nessos and Nesson is used, which describes the word island, but had five total meanings, which not only include island, it includes land within a continent surrounded by lakes, rivers, or streams. And now that the scientific studies have come out showing that not only did the Sahara Desert have a a massive network of rivers, but there's evidence that show that a vast human civilization once spanned the Sahara. So I think we have to wrap our heads around that the it's just far different than what we see it as today. And that being said, I'm going to show you, show you some slides now from what was taken at the wrist shot by the show, The Grand Tour. Let me quick read off this super chat by Mike from Space. It says, there are proofs from all over the earth that it flips 120 degrees each 12,900 years and flips again in seven years. Well, let's see Gravity is push uh, has a book that mentions some of the evidence I found more exists flood from a pole flip. So that's what I identify with. I think that uh, pole flips are the missing link in human cataclysms because I'm going to show you slides, as I'm sure you've seen before, the vast water erosion over the Western Sahara Desert. So it seems to me that something happened that was beyond what we can comprehend in, in as far as cataclysmic events today. I don't believe that was a sustained tsunami. Whatever it was, was a force of water that was, well, I guess I should say sustained in itself, not, not a tsunami, not a tsunami would not be sustained, but a sustained force of water. So let me actually just get to these slides so you guys can see what the hell I'm talking about. But um, while I'm mentioning mission patches here, I want to just remind everybody of the completely bizarre fact that the CIA still has classified documents on the Rishot structure. So in 1967, the CIA did a covert surveillance operation over the Rishot, as well as 15 total sites around the world. And what's so interesting about this, and I know that the font is small, so let me just read it to you. It says, while the scientific um, aspects of this survey are totally unclassified and available to the worldwide scientific community, blank. Oh, you can see this much better here. Blank, redacted. One half of one page and a portion of the next. So let's just be clear here. 57 years later, there are still classified documents on the Rishot structure on behalf of the Central Intelligence Agency. So just to be clear, it was called Pro Project Magnet, not to be confused with the, the other, um, there was a magnet one involving UFOs. This is a separate one uh, operation. So 1967, and the context of it is that they were, or the purpose I should say, was to study the Rishot for, quote, geomagnetic anomalies. 
geomagnetic anomalies. What? Okay, so with Atlantis said to be a special place, I find it highly interesting that the wrist shot has some sort of characteristic that would fascinate the Central Intelligence Agency. And again, I just want to reiterate that it's 57 years later in the very context of this mission is still classified. Why? So these are things that make my uh, my conspiracy wheels spin. Okay, we got Moe's cholesterol levels here. That's a funny name. Going to the Mor going to Mortania next week. Uh, leave us a comment and tell us more. Are you going to the wrist shot? Um, so again, I just want to emphasize, I shared this in a video a few years ago, but it's not everyone might have seen it or it's good to refresh our memories on it, that why was the CIA doing covert surveillance of the wrist shot 67 years ago? Or excuse me, 57 years ago. And here's the path that they did over. They went over in every single direction imaginable. Um, I also want to point out, here's an update, uh, is that and it's not recent, but I'm only becoming aware of it, is that the European Space Agency has declared that this portion over the wrist shot uh, has uh, erosion by wind and water. Now, what you're going to see in these next few slides is going to show you that water was the predominant force that carved this. Obviously, every inch of the Earth has been eroded by wind, of course. But the fact that they're acknowledging that there was a force of water over this that caused the erosion. Now, that being said, let me get into what you're seeing this here are slides right out of the Grand Tour episode called Big Stand. Again, it's on Amazon, where Jeremy Clarkson, James May, and Richard Hammond, some of my favorite people, went to Mauritania. And this is their last special, their last show they've ever done. And everything you're seeing here is images from that show, screenshotted. They had drones and everything. But look at this right here. This is over... I can't tell you exactly how far from the wrist shot, but in the in the region, in the vicinity, what you're looking at right there is textbook water erosion. Right there. That right there may have been the ocean. Look at that. And like I always say, think for yourself. Here's another angle. See that? The same, like, look at that. It looks like the water broke right there. These are the same textbook evidence of, of catastrophic water erosion that Randall Carlson has shared over in the Pacific Northwest in the Badlands. Um, here's another shot. That's not carved by wind right there. I'm not saying that the cliffs haven't had wind erosion, but to emphasize the point and look at all that stand. Here's another shot from down below. That right there, that is what you call a water carved canyon. That was carved by water. And now there's a road running right through it. I don't know how many miles this is from the wrist shot, but this is in the vicinity. That, leave a comment. Let me just double check on the chat here. Leave a comment. Is that not water erosion? I already know that it is, but I want people to, to see it. All right. Yes, exactly. Here's a shot of their cars that they took down there, and they're in a floodplain. Water, they, that was once either the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of a catastrophic force of water. There's another shot. Look at the rims. The rims is the key. Like, let me again go back here. When you look at the rims, that's where water was. This is known. You know, I've been saying it forever. I'm like, this is water erosion. And there it is. Here's one of the cars. I mean, guys, they took a freaking Maserati to, to the Rishot structure. <laughs> But look at the look at the rims. Ignore ignore the car for a second to look right above it. Textbook water erosion. Now people will debate that you know. Well, that was a hundred million years ago. Mm, we're gonna get to that. Here's another here's another image. Look at those beautiful rims. Now, as you can see, they're on asphalt, and I'm so glad that David Sig Hansen, uh, who's been there three times, has notified me that he's like, hey, there is no asphalt road within 200 kilometers of the wrist shot. So this is somewhere at least that distance away at, from what you're seeing here. Uh, but keep in mind that they started from the beach of Mauritania, you know, off the coast of um, Nuwakshot, and then, and, and then moved their way to the wrist shot. Here's another example. They found a little oasis, but um, yeah, carved by water. Water once had blasted through this whole little area right there. So again, just to emphasize, um, and I see uh, some more super chats. I'll read them in just a second. Um, but just to look at this, and this is what Joe Rogan was was harping on, you know. And I love him. He's like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" Right? I mean, look at it. Like, I, you know, again, you could see the those water. Excuse me. The the white blemishes is salt. This has been confirmed. 
Uh, Mauritania exports salt even today. Um, you can see the opening at the south where obviously water had went through it. Um, here's me just comparing it. So that's the end of that slide show. Let me remove this. Oops, let me hit this button here. Okay. One second, Google Slides. Bear with me, I just have to hit this again because it kicked me out earlier as you guys saw. Bear with me, but leave a comment, share what your thoughts are on what you've seen for that water erosion so far. Okay, here we go. It's processing. You know what else you guys should take? This is not a plug. But I got into the smelling salt fiasco, and I can't believe how much this stuff actually works for focus, at least for a few minutes at a time. Ooh, have you ever tried a little uh, sniff of smelling salts? Fifteen bucks on Amazon, um, and I take it later in the afternoon when I don't want to have any caffeine that will keep me up late at night. Uh, so I highly recommend it. Um, and while I'm waiting for this to process, let me quickly read out some super chats. We've got the rabbit hole. I said, Atlanteans invaded North Africa. How, if they're already there, Plato says Atlantis is an island in the mid-Atlantic and describes North America beyond the Atlantean plus underwater pyramid city of Cuba. So the Cuban pyramid thing has been, guys, that's actually false. I looked at the true image and that was the biggest clickbait thing ever. And the fact that that was like back in 2008, we never heard anything again since then, very telling. Um, but again, like I was just saying, I can show you guys the slides that when Plato used the word island, there's five different meanings to the word Nessos and Nesson, which is what he used. One of which is, so is island, promontory, peninsula, and land within a continent surrounded by lakes, rivers, or streams. And that would match the Rishot structure. Because as I'm going to show you, the Tamanrescent River ran right through the Rishot structure. So even if it wasn't at sea level, you have to keep in mind that like when it comes to the Azores, and I'm all about like exploring out there, everywhere needs to be searched but they haven't found anything. And the Atlantic Ocean is one of the most sonared and surveyed uh, seafloor maps in existence because of like, of course, the Cold War era and us looking for sunken Soviet ships with nukes uh, and submarines and all that. Um, so, hey, listen, I'm not anti Azores, but we cannot ignore a site that matches more than a dozen striking similarities. Whether it's the concentric circles, specifically we have water through of land, whether it's the opening to the south, um, you know, people will say that, okay, the Rishot structure is just a collapsed dome. It's natural. Well, there's a few things to be said for this. One of which is that most, even though the scientific consensus is that it's a collapsed volcanic dome, I want to point out that there's no other example of a collapsed volcanic dome near around the world that matches the concentric circle. It's just, the, you can see the resemblance of a sunken, you know, circular shape, but nothing like this. Um, and I also want to point out that Plato had said that Atlantis was created by the god Poseidon, but Poseidon was the god of the sea and earthquakes. So are we to take that, that the god Poseidon was an actual person, or is it quite literally explaining that Mother Nature had created the site? That would imply that it was a natural formation to begin with. And I also want to point out to those who will say that Atlantis was an island, so are islands all of a sudden not natural formations? Think about that. Um, so besides the spectacular nature of it, and, and again, to say that Atlantis had been destroyed by you know, a force of water, this was, right? All those white blemishes, again, are salt. I think that is suggestive evidence that seawater had settled and later evaporated there following whatever it was that bulldozed, bulldozed through the Sahara. And you know, again, if nothing else, why is the, the Rishat structure so little known around the world. Like I meet people all the time and I, it's, it's consistent. People have never seen or heard of this site before, or at least not until they've seen my videos on it. So I'm like, this, if nothing else, should be one of the natural wonders of the world. Um, I mean, and I'm gonna show you evidence later in this video that you know the water had indeed carved over here at that period of time. Um, let me real quick, just double check on my chats. Let's see here. Thank you guys again for the super chats. Um, Definitely leave a comment. How do I make that go away? Go away. All right. Let me make sure everything's good on Rumble. Hey, guys, if you're not following me on Rumble, follow me there. Um, they've been real good to me and they're pro free speech. Uh, smash the like button too. Um, but let me keep this going here. All right. Do, 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 do. It's so funny doing this live, guys, because like this is live. I'm, you know, time now doing this. <laughs> okay. Um, 
further evidence, and you guys have heard me speak about this again, but good effective teaching requires repetition. So let's not forget that there's this bizarre map from Pomponius Maya, who was the Romans' earliest geographer, who created this world map uh, of Pomponius Maya uh, back in like uh, 14 AD. And it happens to annotate the Rishot structure, excuse me, no, Atlantia over the northwest portion of, of uh, the Sahara Desert. And I got these slides out of order, that's why it threw me off. Let me also mention, of course, the map of Herodotus from 450 BC, which if you look closely, it mentions Atlantia uh, in the northwest portion, arguably right over the Rishot structure. Uh, to those who are not familiar, Atlantia or Atlantis in here uh, means Atlas. Again, the first king of Mauritania. And tell me that's not in the same region of the Rishots. What a coincidence. Okay, it was 43 AD for Pomponius Maya. And let me bring in, the map is uh, situated um, to the south. So when you flip it, if you look closely, there it is. Latin for Atlas in the same geographical location of the Rishot structure. Until I shared this a year ago, I could not understand how I've never seen or heard of this before. Um, I see a comment here with people saying uh, the, the measurements from Plato. Hey, guys, uh, something worth mentioning is that I would argue for a couple reasons that the measurements were lost in translation. And besides the fact that it's a, it was a 9,000-year-old story in Plato's time, how many different languages would have changed over that period of time? Even today, the world is divided with comes the metric and the imperial system that the United States uses which I think is ridiculous that we the world split up on that. But most people can't convert, at least quickly, a conversion from imperial to metric. But that being said, I would argue that if there was anything that was lost in translation, it would be the measurements. But even if it was spot on, you have to understand that the Rishot, or excuse me, the description of Atlantis would be approximately three miles across. But that includes the water. Again, three concentric circles, three of water, two of land. So if this was a city that was said to be busy all day and all night and with trade and from, with languages spoken from all over, as it was described, I would argue that the Rishot structure would be a more appropriate comparison because, as I'll show you later in this video, the Rishot is the same size of the modern day metropolitan areas of Paris and Cairo. Guys, if, if there was a city busy all day and all night with languages from all over, that sounds like millions of people. That's a reasonable thing to conclude. And I would argue that the measurements given by Plato are too small. That's just, that's, that's my argument. You know, like, leave a comment and, and disagree. Um, but let's keep going. Again, like, when you just look at the Rishot structure, the concentric circles, I think there's something to be said for that. Um, let me blow past this. Oh, and actually, this paints you a, a picture of, like, okay, three rings of water, two of land. So with the... Rishot being described as being three miles across, you know, how much room does that leave for actual land? Uh, but let me blow through this. You guys have already seen this already. Some fascinating images. Again, opening to the sea at the south. You could see it there for all who have eyes to see that water had went through there. As I'm going to show you later in this these uh, slides, that water was in the Rishot at the time of Atlantis. There's a scientific study that shows that there was aquatic life, including mollusks, that date from 7,700 to 15,000 years ago found inside the Rishot structure. The water was there, guys. Um, okay, let me just go through some of these. Uh, additionally, Atlantis was said to be surrounded by a rectangular plain that was smooth and even. You could argue that here. I'm not saying it's 100%, but I do see rectangular nature in the areas surrounding the Rishot. It's, you can argue this, you know, you could argue it different ways. I'm just pointing out what I believe, you know, is suggestive evidence that supports the, the, the theory, you know? Okay, let me keep going. You have to admit that it is very interesting that Atlantis is described to be made up of white, black, and red color stone. And that is what you see in the area surrounding the Rishnot structure. Red, black, and white color stone. That is a highly specific characteristic. It's one thing to debate measurements, right? Um, but specifics like this. Now, 
here's where it gets even more nuts. And some of you guys heard me speak on this before, but there was an abundance of gold. And the reason why this is so significant is that if you look at the 1851 preliminary treaties on the resources of ancient Mauritania, it tells you very specifically that gold was in considerable quantities, including ivory, which comes from elephants. So elephants, Atlantis was said to have an abundance of elephants. So Africa makes sense. But if you zoom in on this part, says it is a well-authenticated fact that previous to the discovery of America, Europe was supplied to a great extent with gold from Mauritania, which blew my mind when I heard it because I'm like, I, I didn't know that until like a year and a half ago. And I believe it was Nikki from the Nikki and the Jones channel that mentioned that shared this with me, I want to say. Awesome girl, go follow her. She's such a great spirit. But continuing on about this gold, Mansa Musa, who is said to be the richest person in all of human history, whose empire consisted partly of modern-day Mauritania, became the richest man because of gold. And that he, if you look at this next slide, uh, let me go back here. If you read the part that's immediately after the red underline, it says he also owned the Bambuk gold mines, which account for more than 50% of world gold supply today. As this is the reason why the Mauritanian government did not allow ground penetrating radar through its own structure. Let me give a shout out to Josh Sigurdsson of World Alternative Media. They went there with Graham of uh, Archaic Lens. You follow his YouTube channel as well. They went out there. They brought ground penetrating radar to Mauritania, and the government told them at customs that if you use this, you're going to be imprisoned. Because they, and they cited gold. Like, we're not letting you take our gold. That's interesting. Let me point out, I'm not here to debunk Azores or any other site, but there is no gold in the Azores uh, Island. I looked into it. None. Um, and you know, so, okay, so Matsu Musa was richer, nearly as rich as Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. That's pretty epic. Okay, I have it underlined there, but let me keep going here. Again, the elephants, which supports Africa. Uh, you know, Mauritania is known to have elephants. You have them on ancient cave art. Um, so that's another suggestive of evidence. I mean, where are you going to find elephants throughout the world? Um, but this is something, this next point is something that really intrigues me, where it talks about the Gandhi side and found, found no difficulty in making special arrangements for the center island, bringing up two springs of water from beneath the earth, one of warm water, the other of cold. And what makes this so interesting is that here's a study that describes the eye of Africa as a hydrothermal complex. Hydrothermal are hot springs by definition, but here it is. It was cited by Faber of 1999 that describes a hot spring located inside the Rishot structure. That's fascinating. And I just want to point out that hydrothermal features, hot springs, are the most common example of hydrothermal features in nature. What are the odds of that? Um, additionally, when uh, Plato had described that there was mountains to the north, well, we just so happened to have the Atlas mountain chain located to the north in modern-day Morocco. And you can see the Rishat structure from there. Um, all right, so we've got House Mix Plato leaves a super chat, says, why won't the richest man of all time be in the area? That's too much. I don't know exactly what you mean by that. I don't know if you're, I don't know exactly what you mean. Why wouldn't they be? That's too much. I don't know exactly what you mean, but it's fascinating that he was. Um, and again, Atlas, as I'm sure you guys have heard me say a million times, but Atlas, you know, was the said to be the first king of Mauritania. But not only that, the, the very first king of Mauritania was a gentleman named Atlas. Yeah, Atlas of Mauritania, legendary king in the land of Mori. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's the exact same person, whoever was the first king of Mauritania, but the fact that the same exact name was passed down, because you don't see the name Atlas anywhere else in the world. I mean, the Greeks have talked about Atlas, but I'm talking about an actual region that's called Atlas. I find that very interesting. Um, this cites a, a study that talks about this massive uh, network of rivers that would be the 11th largest in history that went right through the Sahara Desert, and one of which was the Taman Reset River which if you look, not only uh, did it evaporate or disappear 5,000 years ago, um, but it existed between 11,700, which is the same date of Atlantis disappearing 11,600 years ago, but it existed at the same exact period of time. And it, what makes it even more interesting is that Plato described having impressive mountains to the north with rivers flowing from them. Well, as you see here, the Atlas River, or excuse me, the Taman Reset River flowed more than 500 kilometers from the Atlas Mountains in northern Africa to the Atlantic Ocean, and it went right over, right through the Rishat structure. Either right, I mean, this could be part of the uh, reason for catastrophic flooding through there. I don't know that for certainty, but like, 
it's the same exact, it went right there. And, and this shows you like right in front of it, like where it was known to flow out. And if I pan out, you'll see that's right. So Cap Tamiris, whatever that is, Timinus, Tamiris, right in front of the wrist shot, where you see that catastrophic water flow. Now, I don't think that catastrophic water flow is from the river, at least not only the river. It had to be something more because you don't see rivers carving the world, something that big today. But look at it. And again, I've argued that this has, uh, whatever this force of water originated from the Mediterranean, if you go further out, it'd be, it originates from North, uh, East Asia. Um, I'm going to have to show you guys that more in a second on, um, give me a sip of water here, but it's there for all who have eyes to see. I mean, look at it. I love Joe Rogan. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I love Joe Rogan. I can't wait to link up with him again. Um, okay. So that's the end of these slides. Let me bring up the next one. Bear with me. Slides, Atlantis 2. This would be quick. Awesome. Okay, so this part is significant because people are going to say, okay, what was this force of alleged force of water you claim eroded, uh, you know, Northwest Africa, uh, or at least the Northwestern portion of the Sahara? So here's a study, the mapping of seabed morphology and shallow sentiment structure of the Mauritanian continental margin, Northwest Africa, and you guys would have seen this in my prior video, but let me remind you, or to those who haven't heard it before, is that there's something called the Mauritanian Seafloor Slide. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the next few slides should show it, where it talks about that 11, approximately 11,000 years ago. So approximately 11,000 could mean 10,000 years, could mean 12,000, it could be 11,600. They have the the you know symbol for approximate. 11,000 years ago, that there was a a large complex slide, and let me. It may have been tsunami genic, which means it may have created a tsunami. But guys, this is located right in front of the wrist shot. And not only that, it's like 150 miles wide from east to west and like 120 something miles wide from north to south. We're talking, all right, good. Here's the slide I was looking for. We compare to modern day Senegal in front of the wrist shot. I think that this is, and this isn't 100% science. Don't get me wrong. I'm just making a case here. Um, I believe that this is suggestive evidence that there was, you know, because if the force of water had blasted through the Sahara, it would have carried the sediment along with it. And obviously, if there was remnants of Atlantis, it'd be off in the Atlantic Ocean now. So the fact that you have a seafloor slide, which is over a mile deep in layered sediment or sediment as it's described, I know this is too blurry for you to see, but it's 3,000 kilometers. Um, or 3,000 meters, I should say, uh, wide or deep from, from top to bottom of layered sentiment, which I think is suggestive evidence of a flow of water it was slowly just pushing it all out, pushing it all out and layered it up. Tell me that doesn't make sense. So what's interesting is that uh, the, the skeptics will say that, okay, the last time that the ocean was over the Sahara was approximately 56 to 66 million years ago at the time of the Trans-Saharan Seaway. But what makes it so interesting is that it does not annotate the Trans-Saharan Seaway going east to west over, you know, the western portion of the of the Sahara. I can see a couple different images here. Here's another image uh, about the Trans-Saharan Seaway, which is going to be important in a few slides. But nowhere does it show it going over the western Sahara Desert. But clearly, a force of water did, which I think means one of two things. One, most likely, is that this is an event that happened far more recently than the time of the dinosaurs. Like, are we really going to pretend that this erosion, that nothing's changed in the Sahara over 60 million years? I mean, considering that the Sahara has gone back and forth from green to desert multiple times, it seems to me that some of this would have been erased. That's just my thoughts on that. And this is just me showing that, okay, it went south, but nowhere does it show it going West. Now, another massive piece of evidence uh, that shows that something happened to the Sahara far more recently involves the tall volcano in the Sahara, which is called Mount Emi Kusi. So there it is. If you pan out, Emi Kusi last erupted approximately 1.2.4 million years ago. Here it is from satellite imagery. And you can see these massive striations carve east of it or southeast if you want to if you're looking north to south right now this is facing east um that right there would be facing west but when you compare the volcano to the striations that you see on the left 
I'm making the case that that's water erosion. When you look at the windiest places on earth, nothing looks like this. Uh, I made a video on this a year ago. You can go look at it, evidence that you know the Great Flood happened over, over the Sahara. But what makes this so fascinating is that its last known eruption is approximately in the 14,000 to 12,400 year range, uh, plus or minus 400 years. I would argue that puts it in the realm of Atlantis if it's saying 12,400 plus or minus 400. Is it unreasonable to say that it could be 11,600? Either way, these dates confirm that there was these are radiocarbon dating uh, that had to do uh, with the lava flow that existed in the southern portion of that mountain, which is what you're seeing here. And what I'm here to tell you is that clearly something eroded and erased that lava flow because the black, as you can see, the dark natured stone is the lava flow. It's basalt. And something had sheared it right off. I mean, it looks like, does that not look like water had blasted right over this? So if that last happened 12,000 years ago, that is in the ballpark range of Atlantis. So basically, I'm making the case here that something happened to the Sahara far more recently than 60, 56 to 66 million years ago. And I don't think that's an unreasonable argument. And again, here's a, another image showing that that same area was known to the Trans-Saharan Seaway. What isn't annotated is going west over the Rishoth. Um, but to make it even more interesting is that salt is found inside that volcanic dome. Uh, at the top, and we're talking 11,200 feet high, that is all salt. It's been confirmed. It's natron salt, which is a combination of the acidity that happens in volcanic nature. There's only two places in the world you'll find this, which is here. And then there's another volcano east uh, in East Africa. I don't know if it's Somalia. I got to double check on, the, on the, the name of the volcano. Forgive me. I'm on the, I'm on the spot here. Um, but there's only two places in the world that they found this natron neut salt uh, inside a volcanic dome, and it's those two places, which I think is suggestive evidence that the ocean blasted over this. And there they are, carrying away some lovely salt. And there it is, the salt pit. Thousands of years ago, it was filled by a deep lake that later evaporated. And by the way, the lake was 1,000 meters deep. How did all that water get in there? Don't say rain. Don't say rain. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. A thousand meters deep? I don't know. But what's interesting is that they also found evidence inside this dome of gastropods, which are a form of aquatic life. Um, so it's like, okay, water was there. Salt is there. It, it, it seems obvious that the ocean blasted through this region, did it not? So again, these are all what I consider strong suggestive evidence that that this is the site. Um, and then when you look at, you know, again, going back to my earlier points, let me just see if there's any more slides. Yeah, see, let me just, before I get to my ADD brain gets distracted here, you know, the, the Saharan salt car caravans uh, right out of Mauritania today. It's right there. Guys, that salt came from the ocean. The ocean blasted through it, and it was far more recently than 56 66 million years ago at the time of the dinosaurs. Do you really think that it's feasible that there would be surface level salt all this time later? Oh yeah, nothing's changed in that region over 60 million years. Here's the, and this is be clear, the fact they are ballparking it over 10 million years. Okay, so between 56 and 66 million years ago, 10 million year window there. Humans in our earliest ancestors are what, 2 million years old? So like, and the very fact that over the last 400, just the last 450,000 years, there's been four, arguably five interglacial periods. This earth changes far more in a shorter period of time than when we're talking 60 million plus years, 66 million years. I do not think that it is a reasonable argument to suggest that nothing has changed there. Oh yeah, the, the salt flats just, it just stayed. Yeah, 66 million years. This is the one corner of the earth that didn't change. Never mind that the Sahara was green 5,000 years ago. I, I think that there's a strong evidence that this is this is what's happened. And oh, okay, so here's that study that talks about mollusks being inside the Rishot structure. Here's an example of mollusks, aquatic life. And here it is, all for so you guys can read it yourself. The Rishot structure, datings of tests of mollusks in, in brackish waters, which is salt, the ages included between 15,000 and 7,700 years ago, smack dab in the middle of when Atlantis was said to have existed. 11,600 years ago. So this is what I'm talking about, not to toot my own horn on you know, exponentially you know, building on this case from the documentary that I saw, 
But the very fact that this originates from the Egyptians, it's not unreasonable to say that they would have came from West Africa, back before it was the Sahara Desert. Um, I'm not sure what these slides mean. This is, again, a reminder that it was green up until 5,000 years ago. Um, it was home to people, animals, and lush vegetation. Somewhere between 11,500, or excuse me, 11,000 and 5,000 years ago, it went away. Let me make another point here. Notice how they say 11,000 to 5,000, that's a 6,000 year window. Smithsonian has 8,000 to 4,500 years, that's a 4,000, 4,500 year window. Puts it right at the same period of time of uh, the Great Pyramid. So, what is it unreasonable to say that maybe Atlantis got destroyed and the people left and went over to Egypt from there and started building pyramids? Um, a lot of people, again, when it comes to the Azores, guys, I'm not here to debunk it, um, but because I think all areas should be explored, but I just want to reemphasize that Atlantis was said to be an empire made up of 10 kingdoms. It's not unreasonable that those other nine would have been in the geographical region, which includes the Azores, mind you. So, you know, I'm all for any single area of interest for people to pursue. I think we all have a calling to pursue different things. Um, but again, this is to emphasize, you know, because I know the counter argument is that people say, well, the Rishot's natural. It's not Atlantis. Well, okay. Poseidon was said to be the god of the sea and earthquakes and horses. And uh, the actual Greek translation for the word Poseidon, the ancient Greek translation, means either, quote, husband of the earth or Lord, Lord of the Earth. Tell me that's not a translation or that we call Mother Nature today. I'm not here to think that it was built by a person. And I also want to emphasize, as far as it being a natural formation, we build on bizarre natural formations throughout history, and we still do today. You know, at the tops of mountains and on the edge of cliffs. I don't even know where this is. Is this Thailand? Or is this Indonesia? Beautiful. I want to go there. Um, I also want to make another point. So if Atlantis was said to be busy all day and all night and with trade with people spoken from languages all over, I want to point out that if you were to leave the Mediterranean and go outside, because a lot of people will say, okay, Plato described that Atlantis was west of the Pillars of Hercules. Now, first of all, he never said west. He said in front of the pillars. That is something that I'm surprised at how many different people have mistranslated that. In fact, I should have the exact quote here. Yeah, this is right out of MIT from the um, uh, Timaeus. Island situated in front of the straits. Now again, island, use the word, Plato used the word Nessos and Nesson, which has five different, different translations. But I want to point out, guys, that if you're to leave the strait, you had three choices. You either follow the coast to the uh, north or follow coast to the west or go straight out into the endless oblivion of, of the island. Um, so is that reasonable to suggest that a place that was so busy in trade would be in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, as some have suggested? Or is it far more likely that you would follow the coast and go into a region that goes right in front of the uh, um, the Rishot structure? And by the way, it's worth mentioning that the sea currents, when you leave the Straits of Gibraltar, carry you south. I've already made this point. Yeah. So. And, and this is showing a, a measurement of just under 1,200 miles as the bird flies. Of course, if you were to wrap around this general area, um, that cove or whatever you want to call it, it would significantly increase the distance. I'm just trying to like give you a ballpark idea of the distance that that's equivalent from New York City to Lincoln, Nebraska. It's a very far distance, but it would take you right in front of the wrist shot. And considering that it appears the ocean was there, like we have to, you know, there's no one can prove that the elevation of Northwest Africa wasn't at sea level at that period of time. How can you unprove, how can you, you know what I mean? Like something happened, but you know, I'm not here to, you know, deny science. So um, another key fact is that, you know, Atlantis of course was said to be, you know, disappeared to the depths of the sea, but he goes on, Plato went on to say that only reeds on the surface of the water was left. And he goes on to say that the sea in the area is impassable to navigation, which is hindered by mud just below the surface, the remains of the sunken city. That does not describe something at the bottom of the ocean. What is literally, you know, impassable barrier of mud and reeds of grass, no longer accessible by ship. Well, guys, reeds of grass is something that, that uh, grows in less than 20 feet of water. I looked it up. <laughs> um, and it sounds reminiscent of a salt marsh to me. Does it not? So 
let me remove this. So again, if you were to look at the, the slides, you know, showing that region of Africa that was clearly obliterated by the ocean, I think when you put all this stuff together, it, it clearly shows that the Rishot structure is by far the most likely location. Um, so let me take a second and let me look at the chat. Now it's time to take some questions. What are you guys thinking? I haven't seen any of the comments in the last 20 minutes. All right, so Mo's cholesterol levels again has the funniest screen name. It says, it seems like in past writers mixed fact and fiction in the same work, like prose, ada, and some Greek works. Any idea? So here's what I think, is that Atlantis was 11,600 years ago. Let me give you guys some food for thought. The English language, Old English is less than 1,500 years old, and modern English is less than 500 years old. Um, I took an anthropology course in my undergrad for an elective, and this I was fortunate to have this brilliant professor. It was Dr. Ader or something like that, but he was like this prestigious guy. There was like 300 people in this class. I didn't know what I was getting into, but he had described that languages change approximately 19% every 1,000 years, and he said that's the comparison of what is modern day French to English, just 19%. So, I mean, if you look at the fact that just from Plato's time, you have ancient Greek, Latin, whatever other languages were intermixed to get to old English and then modern English and all the other languages in between. And then not to mention that whatever the languages that were spoken by the dynastic Egyptians and before them, the Canetians, and then, and then you still have another 9,000 years before that. So like we're talking, potentially dozens of languages. So I think that we have to entertain that loss in translation is unfortunately a real thing. But obviously, for a tale that was so important, they carved it in their stones at the Temple of Sais in Neith, Egypt, that um, has since been gone, that was taken out by the Nile River. Those stones are surely at the bottom of it somewhere. But when you look at very highly specific characteristics involving, like, say, the concentric circles and other things, um, it seems to me that there are certain aspects of this story that are real. Um, let me see what else we got here. We got Philippe Oliveira, or Felipe Oliveira, uh, says, Jimmy, it would be great if you can invite an academic that already researched the Rishot to talk about it on your channel. I would love that. And you know who I really, really want? Is Dr. Robert Schock. Dr. Robert Schock is the man, as you, I'm sure most of you or all of you had the groundbreaking work involving the Sphinx's wall. Now, I adore Dr. Robert Shaw. That guy is brilliant. I think he is an intrepid fellow because as a tenured professor at Boston University, for him to stick his neck out to contradict the mainstream academic version of the Egyptians is a significant thing to do. And to those of you who aren't familiar, he basically said that, you know, hey, this is vast water erosion around the Sphinx's enclosure. They say that the Sphinx was created 4,200 years ago. However, the last time the Nile Delta region had significant rainfall was like 9,000 years ago, like 7,000 BC. So, you know, I would like for him to look at this, but here's the problem with Dr. Robert Schock. He doesn't have a problem, but let me just say, he's very, very, all right, so he's very anti Younger Dryas climate uh, um, cosmic impact theory. And to be honest with you, I'm more identifying with him when it comes to sun cycles, uh, a pole shift. He doesn't talk about pole shifts, but I am starting to think that it's more than just a cosmic impact. Although, because there is evidence for a cosmic impact, but for me, I'm like, well, there was two events. The Younger Dryad started 1,100 years ago and ended 11,600 years ago. So I'm inclined to think that there was two events. Who talks about that? Something caused a deep freezing and something caused a rapid warming. So what if there was a pole flip that caused the, the, um, the freezing? Um, or the Earth shields went down, uh, were greatly diminished during the pole shift. This is mainstream science, mind you. Um, and involving the poles the geomagnetic poles diminishing, reducing the Earth's atmosphere. Okay. So that would leave us more vulnerable to two things. One, sun activity, which is what he claims. We got blasted by plasma. And we'd also be more susceptible to cosmic impact. So what's to say that there wasn't a geomagnetic pole shift 12,800 years ago, which I'm going to share with you evidence, not on this live stream, but I've been building on this, that that indeed happened. Um, you should follow the work of Ben Davis and his suspicious, suspicious observers. He's been covering this. Um, but um, What's to say that, because like, okay, if we got hit by an asteroid and it caused some changes on Earth, wouldn't it eventually correct itself? This is why I lean towards a pole shift. So where I'm going back to tie into Dr. Robert Schock, 
is that he's very, very um, stuck in a lot of his opinions. And I respect that. If he thinks he's right, good for him. But like when it comes to like, for example, the Yonogini monument, as it's called off the coast of Japan, those underwater relics, which to me looks, it's so apparent that that is indeed created, you know, it's an ancient ruin. Let me just, I'm going to bring it up for you guys. Yona Guni Monument, Japan. Bear with me. I'm going to bring this right up. It'll be worth it to you. Get a nice little friendly. Okay, one second. Bear with me, bear with me. Okay. I'm assuming you guys can see this. Yes, you can. Some of these shots were taken by Graham Hancock and his wife, Santa, by the way. Um, but when I look at these features, that is not it. That is fake. Don't look at it. That's real. This is kind of a map of showing what it actually looks like. It's blurry. Let me find a better one. Sorry, guys. When you do this on the fly, you risk looking at crappy photos. I mean, come on. Now, let me just be clear. That is not a staircase. That is only approximately 10 inches wide. It's deceptive. Um, but I'm like, this doesn't look like a force of water erosion to me. And if it were the case, we'd see it in other places around the world somewhere. And we don't see it anywhere else. I believe that this is man-made. It's 120 feet down at its depth. Dr. Robert Schock, who went scuba diving here, and apparently he didn't go deep because he was struggling with the current, he, had, he prematurely concluded that this is surely just natural. And him and Graham Hancock strongly disagree with each other on that, as you can imagine. So the point here where I'm going with that is that I love Dr. Robert Schock. However, I, I want to know that he would look at the Rishot structure, or let me rephrase. I'm not talking about asking him about the Atlantis theory. I'm talking about evaluating the water erosion that blasted through the Sahara. And I want to know that he's going to look at it with a fair mind because I already know he doesn't like me. This goes back years. He made a comment about one of my videos. He basically said, I don't have a clue. This is years ago. Um, and I don't harbor any ill will, but I'm like, man, when it comes to these academics, you know, they don't want to hear what some writer has to say or what some YouTuber has to say. Um, there is a, there, you know, it's like an ivory tower, so to speak. But I would really like to sit down with him and just share this stuff and be like, what are your honest thoughts? If he could give an honest opinion on that water erosion blasting through the Sahara, that would be extremely important and significant. And um, I would really like to hear what he has to say. I just want him to look at it with an open mind. Um, but I adore him. So I have nothing bad to say about him. And if he thinks it's not, I, I want to hear why. I want him to show me. But I've already done this in a prior video from like a year ago, I should try to find the slides where I literally brought images from an actual geology textbook and I showed water erosion, water, you know, literally striations carved from water flow. And it matches, especially if you zoom in the specific areas of, of detail around the wrist shot and in front of it, it is, it is a match. Like in that same video, I believe I showed, I looked up the world's top 10 most windiest places on earth. And none of them, not one single one of them, has any type of resemblance to these catastrophic striations that you see over Northwest Africa. It's water erosion. Like, I don't, how is it not? Um, you know, it's like, because some people say, well, you're not a geologist. How do you know? I'm like, okay, you don't like go to school and get a PhD in geology and get like some secret information that isn't available on the internet. The textbooks are available online and I looked at them. It is. I should find the slides in front of me. Um, they're they're buried in something. I don't have it prepared in this. In this, uh, I should have thought to bring that up. Um, so that just drives me wild, guys, because I'm like, oh come on, people got to give this a shot. Like I'm not, again, I didn't say I'm 100% on the wrist shot being Atlantis. I am open minded enough to know that it's possible that it's not. But if if I had to bet on it, I'd bet the whole farm on it. I'm like this. There's too many striking similarities. Um, but in my mind, and I know there's people watching, listening right now, it says it's not Atlantis. I respect your opinion, but here's the part I really, really want us to focus on is what the hell happened to the Sahara Desert to cause that catastrophic water flow. Like, hey, let me mention Randall Carlson. He doesn't think that the Rishot's Atlantis. Um, and to be fair, every single argument, there's about five of them that he's made against it. I already addressed in my last video, not directly at him because I'm not trying to create some sort of like rivalry. But every single argument he's made against it is has been addressed and has been explained. Nothing about it debunks it. But but I respect his opinion. And maybe he's right. 
But if nothing else, to those of you that don't think the wrist shot could be Atlantis, even Randall Carlson himself has stated that this and all around the wrist shot is obvious catastrophic water flow. And like I showed you in a slide earlier, even the European Space Agency acknowledges that the wrist shot structure was eroded by water. And they mentioned wind as well, <laughs> but water. So it's like, when did that happen and how did it happen, right? So there's something here, here. So even this pretend Atlantis never existed in the first place. Okay. In the context of modern, you know, climate change and this whole narrative that's going on and this raging debate, we need to take a look at what the, happened to the Sahara Desert. Because as I was showing you in those slides a few minutes ago, they were saying, I could show you multiple scientific studies that say that the Sahara had either turned from green to a desert over the course of 6,000 years, one says 5,000 years, one says 4,500 years, another says 1,000 years, and even a more recent one says possibly within one century. So in the context of modern climate change and humans affecting quote unquote rate of change, if they can't articulate virtually an entire continent, and I'm referring to just Northern Africa, the Sahara Desert, so big, practically the size of a continent itself, okay? I understand Africa is a continent. Um, but to change that from green and saturated with water, rivers and lakes, to a desert and possibly as little as one century, as they're starting to think. But if they can't even articulate it within a ballpark of 6,000 years, they can't conclusively say, then to what percentage can they state of rate of change that we're doing today if they can't articulate how fast it happened to the Sahara? Think about that. And there is other factors that go into climate change as well, which I've been diving into. Milankovitch cycles, which have three variables, one of which, one of which involves the precession of the Earth, the wobble, which is the mainstream scientific explanation for why the Sahara turned green. Another which is eccentricity, which involves the orbit of the Earth around the sun, which apparently varies greatly. Right now, we're at a near circular orbit, but it actually extends to an elliptical orbit uh, over time. Um, another which is the Earth's tilt which right now is at 23.4 degrees, but at one point in the past, it was 22.1, and the future will be 24.5. All of that influences the tropics. Um, and, and by the way, when it, when it comes to the Earth's precession, let me just point out that not only, so Polaris is our North Star now, but it used to be Vega, and it's going to be Vega again. That difference, as far as degrees in the sky, is going to make the Northern Hemisphere Face away from the sun, and that January will be summer. Look it up. In the northern hemisphere, the summer used to be in January. I was blown away when I heard this. Why aren't we talking about this in the context of modern day climate change? Because those three variables I just mentioned involving the Melanchthon cycles are happening all day, every day. It never stops. Now, of course, gradual, immeasurable day by day, of course. But like, if it was significant enough that just 5,000 years ago, it turned the Sahara Desert from a green uh, tropical paradise to a desert. This is a, a, a significant factor that needs to be discussed. Something else I don't hear in the context of modern day climate change are sun cycles. For example, I don't hear anything about the Little Ice Age, which went from the year 1350 to, the, to 1850, um, where there was uh, global cooling in the Northern Hemisphere by three degrees Fahrenheit or 2.6 degrees or two degrees Celsius or so around that, that mark. Um, so which was so significant that it caused disease, famine, and reduction of livestock in the Northern Hemisphere just a few hundred years ago. It involves the Maunder Minimum, which involves sun cycles, reduced sunspots. This is science. Um, there was also um, what's called the Roman warming period approximately 2000 years ago, which was extended over 450 years from like 250 BC to like, whatever it was, 400 AD, something in that ballpark where there was warming in the Northern Hemisphere. It was three degrees Fahrenheit warmer, two degrees Celsius. So, so much warmer that in England, they had an abundance of, the Romans had an abundance of wine vineyards. Why don't I hear about that in the context of modern day climate change? And here's my big question. Okay, so what percentage, because they talk about rate of change, rate of change, rate of change, okay. So what percentage of rate of change are all these factors from sun cycles, Milankovitch cycles, all of this being contributed to our change today? Here's another factor, and this is from Dr. Ian Plimmer out of Australia, a geologist, that has discussed that, okay, they're talking about CO2, it has to do with CO2. And I know people are probably in the comments saying, CO2, CO2. Okay, so 
humans contribute approximately 3% of CO2 today. 97% is natural from volcanoes and particularly seafloor vents at the bottom of the ocean. So in his words, he says that if they can't disprove that the other 97% isn't changing our environment, then it's, in his word, words, game over involving their narrative. It's an interesting argument because you never hear about the other 97%, do you? Um, I also want to point out that they make CO2 out to be the devil. But if you do a little bit of research, you'll find that CO2 is literally pumped into greenhouses today. And it creates as much as a 30% higher yield. Uh, CO2 is plant food. Um, let me give you some more examples. At the, at the height of the dinosaurs, well, let me rephrase it like this. Right now, we're at approximately 420 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. 420, one number. Um, but at the height of the dinosaurs, at the time when they had the uh, biggest animals and the most abundance of all vegetation known in Earth's known history, it was at 6,000 parts per million. That's 1,328% higher than it is now. And life was flourishing. I have reason to believe that the narrative that we're being pushed. In fact, actually, let me stop myself. Never mind what Jimmy thinks. I'm a non-expert. There is somebody named Dr. John Clauser, who is the 2022 Nobel Prize laureate in physics. He's been making some headlines as of late. As of just this last November, he's been speaking out involving the narrative involving climate change. Um, and he thinks that it's a scam because they're misrepresenting the data and they're going to cause an economic doomsday, uh, completely unnecessary. And he's been going on and on and on about this. So, you know, when I look at true experts, such as somebody that won the Nobel Prize in physics, people will say, because I saw this on Twitter, follow me on Twitter if you're not. Go follow me there. I've been blowing that crap up. Um, people say, well, physics has nothing to do with geology and climate change. We need a real climate scientist. I'm like, there's no such thing as a climate scientist. But if you actually look up a study of climate science itself, physics is the key aspect of it. People will excuse anything. Um, I hope I haven't missed any super chats. I got one. Okay, we got one from Victor Brewer. I would love to do some aerial LIDAR work on the Sage Wall. I own a drone LIDAR and photograph, uh, photo uh, grammetry uh, uh, com uh, company. Excuse me. Uh, hit me up if you would like us to get that region lidar We have a high-end LIDAR setup. We go all over the world. Okay, so hold on. Please hit up Mike Collins of the of, of the Wandering Wolf channel. You can find him on YouTube. You can find him on Twitter, Instagram. He's in the process of doing this stuff. Uh, he had ground pen training radar that he went out there with this last summer. Brother, get in touch with him. You should collaborate with him. Um, look, yeah, he's the guy. I don't want to, I want him to do it. He's, and he's such a charming, lovely man. I love him. Uh, so Michael Collins of uh, Wandering Wolf, check him out. Let me go to my rumble here. Let's see here. Make sure everything's up and running. Okay. Oh, wow. We got some awesome super chats. All right. I got one from Joe Wall, 287. It says, hey, Jimmy, where can people send you research that isn't online? The close-up Rishot Wall image is really cool, by the way. By the way, email Dr. Shock about the uh, Rishot and his response said solar flares made it. Well, that's fascinating. Oh, I have to talk to him. I have got to talk to him. Guys, you should know that because you said LOL at the end of it. I, I thought the same when people say it's a plasma discharge. I'm like, what are you talking about? But then I saw this a similar site on Mars that is very, very eerily similar to the Rishot structure. And I'm like, I'm becoming more and more open-minded. I just have to see something. Like, I'm like, people talk about plasma striking up from the sun and blasting us. But like, all right, so when Dr. Robert Shock says that, I need to look into that. Um, oh, we got a very generous super chat uh, from Jay Petalos. Said, uh, oh, and by the way, I'm sorry, uh, Joe Wall 287, where can you send me research that isn't online? I hate to plug it. And let me just say thank you to all my Patreon supporters, but follow me on Locals. You, The link is attached to the Rumble link. Um, I do a once, once a month a live Q&A uh, for my exclusive supporters on Locals. And that is a 100% guaranteed way of getting in touch with me. Um, you can send me messages and it is a guarantee because I get flooded with messages and my brain can't handle the emails. I can't handle the DMs. There's so many I haven't checked. I'm not, my brain wasn't wired that way. Um, I need to get an assistant and I've been saying that for years, but I don't trust anybody. Um, I just, I, 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 I'm a recluse. I spend most of my time alone. Um, I'm a, I'm a socialite when I'm in the mood, but then the rest of the time, I just, it's tough for me to like respond to emails, what I'm trying to tell you. So I'm not asking you to give me money on locals, but as a surefire way to get in touch with me. 
Um, okay, back to Jay Patelos said, would love for you to link up with, oh yeah, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Drum of Land of Chem. He uh, deserves some time with you and Ben and Christopher Dunn. Please take time to check him out. I'm already following him. I've been in touch with him on Instagram. Ian is lovely uh, uh, bride to be. I've been following them both for a while now um, and they're awesome. They're killing it. In fact, I'd like to go to Egypt with them. Um, let's see here. What's everyone else saying? I'm going to go for a few more minutes, but if you guys keep sending me awesome questions, I will definitely see them. In fact, let me go back over to my YouTube link to see what I've missed. There should be a link to hit Super Chats. One second. Bear with me. Where's that stupid link? Okay. Here we go. All right. I'm going to find the ones that I've missed. Thank God. Okay. Mona N, are you planning on any videos of visiting Malta? Yes, but I want to go there. I need to go there first. I need to step foot on it. And I'm planning. I don't have it in the world yet. I intend to go to Europe, Greece, Rome. I haven't been to Italy, guys. I need to go to Rome. That's high on my list. Rabbit Hole said, ancient cattle parks caused de uh, uh, desertification of North Africa. Yes. That's what I'm, this is what I'm saying. It was cow farts, ancient cow farts. If the stupid pharaohs had simply taxed the proletariat, it could have been, these effects could have been alleviated. We could have beachfront property in the middle of the uh, Sahara. So cow farts, those ancients could have done away with them. Um, Hans Cake Stealer uh, said, are you still planning to head out to the Sage Ball this year? Yes. As soon as it warms up, I want to go with Michael Collins, who I was just mentioning. Um, I have to go there and see it with my own eyes. Absolutely. Um, Velvet Eric gave me $9.99. Thank you so much. Uh, same thing with uh, Inamata Paul. I'm saying that right. Light Bro Toll said, thank you for all you do for me. Thank you so much. Um, let me see here if there's any others I've missed. Because I hate to miss them. Um, skunk nipples. That's a funny one. Hey, Jimmy, love your channel. I'm certain that at some point you'll be proven right about this being the location of Atlanta. Shout out to Lou Solo. That's the Lou Solo. I don't know how to say that. Um, I really appreciate that. All I want credit for is for bringing attention to this side. Again, I'm not the first person that, that, that developed, I'm not the one that developed this theory. It, it dates back a few decades. There's an auto something. I wish I could get up to reach the book. It's covered it's too far away because my mic's plugged in. Um, but then the visiting Atlantis, Georges Alexander and Ellis Rosen, as I just mentioned, like, I feel I deserve some credit for bringing, putting it on blast and exponentially growing the theory with supporting evidence. Um, nobody, let me gleefully say how proud I am for getting it more attention. Um, because I just, it's fun and exciting to share something interesting with a bunch of people. Um, but, you know, that being said, the visiting Atlantis documentary was behind a payroll on the Gaia network. And the edition that was on YouTube only had like 7,000 views when I came across it in 2018. Nobody had heard this theory. Um, so I'm very proud to have been built on it. Because I, I point this out because I get hated on people. Like, it's not his theory. It's not his theory. I'm like, I never claimed it was. I claimed in my first few videos to millions and millions of people that it wasn't. Um, so I've never claimed it. I'm just very prideful that I brought the attention to more people and I built on it. So um, if nothing else, I think it would be cool if uh, the history book said that uh, a YouTuber named Jimmy had, had brought some attention to it and some predominant scientists finally explored it and proved it and, and, and did see more exploration off the west coast of Africa. That would bring me joy. <laughs> um, let's see here. I'm trying to see if I missed any others. Uh, let me scroll down here. Okay, we got uh, one from uh, Arachnius Webb. Do you have any opinion on all the stories uh, about Noah's Ark on Mount Ariat or Ararat? Why am I, I can't pronounce anything today. I haven't been able to see much besides an ABC story from the 2009 on some grainy Chinese Christian group's footage. Okay. Honestly, I have absolutely no idea. I hate, I hate to not have, I don't know what to think of Noah's Ark. I just don't, I don't know what to think. I, if you want to know what I really think, I think that, um, the, the, um, Underground uh, cities in Turkey, and there's really 200 of them, some of which a few, handful of them are so big that it could support tens of thousands of people and livestock. Um, I would, to me, that feels like the ark. I'm not saying there wasn't a boat. I feel like there's some translation uh, aspects of the Noah's Ark story involving the boat. I don't, I don't know. That. I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, but as far as what they thought they found, I mean, I remember hearing about it and it just went away. And I feel like if it was proven, it'd be something that would be impossible to be ignored, especially in this modern realm of online activity and social media that we have. You can't ignore things now. 
the mainstream media wants to shun and ignore things, they're getting millions and millions of views elsewhere. Uh, Mario, uh, we got uh, Decky69 says, uh, Mario Build Reps covers expanding Earth, ancient poles, and ancient structure orientation. Yes, I follow him. I need to look at his work. It's been a little while. Um, I do identify, or I think that there's some truth to the expanding Earth theory. I think it would make a lot of sense, especially when you look at that document, the Adam and Eve story. It talks about, you know, a micronova exploding up in the Earth and, you know, causing, you know, mass movement of the continents. It That would explain the tidal forces necessary to have blown away the Sahara Desert. That was that was not a tsunami from some C4 earthquake that, you know, like that was something sustained. And I look at, when I see, you know, pole shifts and expanding earth, it makes me think that there was something there. Um, David Malton says, hey, I heard you live in Arizona. Let's have lunch. I'm running for office. Look me up and reach out. I'm easy to find. David Malton, Penal County, Arizona. Love what you're doing. Big fan. Lunch on me. Yeah, brother. I'm in the uh, Henson Chandler area. Um, I'm going to look you up. I appreciate the invite. Um, let's see here. I'm just going to go for a couple more minutes. If you guys are blowing me up with more questions, I'm going to stop. Um, let's see here, because I can only go so long before I become parched. Let's see here. I'm in an hour and 23 minutes. I'll take a couple more questions. Brady React says, Jimmy, they're going to hunt you down if you keep exposing them. I'm not too worried. And what can I say? The adrenaline rush of feeling like I'm being hunted will keep me going anyways. But I don't think that I'm sharing anything. Anything I'm sharing is already out there. I'm sharing what? Declassified documents? You know what I mean? Um, I, I, look, if they haven't taken out Alex Jones or David Icke yet, I don't think I'm too high on the, on the list. And by the way, to anyone wondering, <laughs> God, these are smelling salts to anyone that didn't hear me talk about it earlier. I thought the fad of people doing this was so obnoxious, but I finally tried it and I'm sold. I'm like, this stuff actually works. I don't do caffeine later in the afternoon because it'll keep me up late, uh, late and disrupt my sleep. But no joke, this works. If you do a whiff of these smelling salts, it literally does a jolt in your brain and it does help with focus. It just looks, you look stupid when you do it because your eyes water up. So I, I feel dumb doing it on a live stream, but <laughs> whatever. All right, let's see here. We got Andre Helmuth. It says, do you know Billy Carson? Follow any of his stuff. I've recently become aware of him in the last couple months. I need to do a deep dive on him. I haven't done the deep dive yet. I've seen he's been making the rounds on some cool podcasts. So um, I need, he's someone I need to get in touch with. I'd like to link up with him because he's clearly, but I, I don't, I don't know all of his stuff. Let me be clear. Um, let's see here. Let's see, someone says it's a drug. Yeah, this is a it's a bottle of the pure Colombian bam bam. I didn't say that. It's a joke. I don't do drugs, um, except for cannabis. Uh all right, most cholesterol levels again. What up, Mo? All right. Excited for the total eclipse. So surreal to see for that uh the phenomenon that made mythologies. Yeah, when I, I was in Boise, Idaho when the one happened in was it twenty it would have been twenty seventeen. Was it 16? 17? Um, and that blew my mind because I experienced the total eclipse. That was gnarly. It was a trip to see how dark it got in such a short period of time. And then lighting back up, the birds got quiet. It it threw me off, too. Um, I remember reading stuff. They said that it can change your, what is it, the effects of your brain adjusting with the sun cycles when the sun goes down? What is it? Your, um, there's a word that starts with a C, I think. Circadian rhythm. It throws that off, and I, yeah, it was almost like I want to use the word euphoric, but it was a trip. So glad I experienced that. I don't know if I'm going to see it this year. I don't have any plans to go look at it. All right. Any more questions on Rumble? Anything else? Let's see here. Yeah. Alonzo Musk, Jimmy's addicted to smelling salt. I, honestly, it is somewhat addicting. It hurts. It hurts so good, so to speak. Um, I tell you what, I'm going to reach out to this company and see if they want to do a sponsorship deal because they actually believe in it. For $15 in the last few months, um, you can't go wrong. I mean, I, I okay, this is, I'm not plugging, this is just me. I don't have a deal with them. But for $15, I encourage you, if you're like on the fence, don't put it too close though. Buy it and try it for yourself. So those of you who work or write for a living or whatever, depending on what kind of job you have, I can see it being quite effective. I, I've experimented with it. It just, you look stupid, right? It looks dumb. I look dumb doing this. All right. Um, okay. I am curious to see what everyone 
thoughts are though, as far as seeing, as far as the entire um, presentation I just did. Oh, let me also just say while I'm at it, if you're on YouTube. Please follow me on Mumble. They've been very good to me. I can't have YouTube my entire nest day, guys. There's so much stuff behind the scenes involving censorship you guys don't even know because I like to be a professional and not complain about just feeling like my channel's been take, taking some things and like, I don't want to get into it because I just like, shut up. Um, but like, I would encourage you to follow me on Rumble. I encourage you to follow me on X Twitter as well. If you really support my work or really want to support me in any way, contribute to either my Patreon or my locals, um, preferably local. I don't do much on my Patreon other than I upload the video. Whenever I make a new video, oh, I have a big update here. Whenever I make a new video, I upload to Patreon and Locals the night before. So you have first access to leave a comment, see it before anyone else. So that's fun. Um, but I will say is that a lot of people ask me, like, where's your typical videos? Where are they? So I've been doing these live streams on Rumble, but I haven't been a huge fan of them because I don't feel like I'm that great at it. Um, what I'm really good at in my mind is making video presentations. This is what you guys, this is what built my channel. This is how you found me in the first place. And, um, I've gone away from it. I've been doing some traveling. I have a big trip coming up soon. I'll keep you guys posted on that. Um, but hold on, let me, let me remove this comment. Hold on. What's this person? With? Hold on one second. Where'd that go? I lost it. Keep an eye out. Anyway. So I'm doing a deal with Rumble to get back on track of doing my typical video presentations. It's going to start in April. I'm going to be doing at least two videos a month. I'm back. I'm starting what I call a new season of Bright Insights. I had went down that path of getting making so many videos, and it's kind of a perishable, perishable skill set. It's hard to make videos after it's been a while, at least to make them as engaging as I used to. So um, I'm very excited for to get back on track because I got like a stockpile of videos. Uh, I have some tremendous ideas that are going to blow some people away. Some of the information includes stuff that I just shared in this video, but I'm going to break it down, you know, for you to actually see it. Um, but many other things as well. Uh, so that being said, starting in April, you're going to be seeing at least two videos a month. And then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, if you're not following the Y files on YouTube, you are missing out. AJ over there is such a cool guy. He does such thought provoking videos. It's my favorite YouTuber. And if you've noticed, what he does is he uploads a video. He's like weekly. He's got a team, by the way. He has a team that helps him do research and write and, and help with it. So I kind of need to do that if I want to keep up. But anyway, what he does is he uploads his thought-provoking presentation. And then he does a live stream like the next day or that night. And he, it's focused on the video. He takes questions. He discusses it. He shares what wasn't included, the research. I'm like, this is brilliant. Uh, and I've been in touch with AZ, by the way. I need to get back in touch with him again. We were exchanging messages on X. But such a cool guy. But that's what I'm going to do. I'm like, this is brilliant. Um, I'm like, you know, these live streams have been taking away from me focusing on my presentations. And I'm like, this is brilliant. Make presentations like I have. And so anyways, that's what I'll be doing. So look forward to April. Um, and let me also, do you want to know where I'm going to go this month? I just need to coordinate with some family. So I don't want to like announce this because I haven't, my family has to look after my dogs. But I'm going to Japan. There is ancient megalithic stonework there that I believe is strong evidence of global civilization, poly polygonal, polygonal stonework that matches South America and different parts of the world, including Egypt. And I want to go there and see it for myself and document it. So I'm going to be there in the next couple of weeks. I don't want to say exactly when, because it's not 100% until I can ensure the logistics involving my family and dogs. Because when you have dogs, it's like, it be more difficult than kids in some way. I don't know if that's, not everyone's going to agree with that. That might be a stupid comment. But like people that have dogs, when you, especially when you have a few of them, like it's, you know, hey, that being said, I'm going to Japan. Uh, I'll just let you guys know when. And so that's going to be this month. And that's going to be a fantastic video. And to those of you guys who have been following me closely, I, I've been a ball back and you still haven't seen a video on that yet. I got some sweet, sweet shots. Um, Deki69 asked Yoga Yonaguni. I'm actually not going to Yonaguni. I'm not a scuba diver. Um, I'll have to go back there at some point for that. Uh, a carbon atom. What are you saying? Well, I'm not going to say where I'm staying because I'm still looking at booking stuff. I have some general ideas. Um, I will say that I'm going to visit, uh, you know, of course, Imperial Palace, um, Osaka, and a couple other places. Um, but I can't wait. Uh, but that being said, are there any other questions? I think I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I'm going to take my dogs for a walk. I want to thank you all for all the love and the the super chats and all the support. Um, real quick, I got one from Equita Paul. Check out the Time Detective channel. I believe his research would aid yours greatly. He's eccentric, but very intelligent. I haven't even heard of him. All right, I'm going to check him out. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, if there's any other super chats, I'll stay around a minute because I hate to like conclude when people are like having so much fun in the chat. But I guess I will close it up. Uh, hit the like button. Um, if you like this, share. Again, follow me on Twitter slash X. You can follow me on Instagram, but it's trash. Um, but Instagram, I share stuff there all the time. So if you want to focus my travels in Japan, if you want to be the first to know I went to Japan, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. If you want to support me, uh, follow me on Locals. If you're a paid contributor, you can participate in my monthly uh, live Q&As um, by leaving a question. It's 100% guarantee I'll read it and respond. Um, and support me on Patreon. Again, I don't do enough on there, but if you love my work and you want to just help Jimmy out, um, I'm all about it. But that said, I want to say thank you to everybody for all your time and uh, stay tuned. In the next couple of weeks, I'm going to have an awesome video and travels to come. So I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And thank you guys again. I hope you enjoyed.